Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. A Fascinate Productions podcast for drug science. Hello there, Drug Science podcast listeners. I'm Sam Brown, one of the producers of the show. This episode is the first of a two-part live show, recorded in November, all about psychedelics. Once Professor Nutt has finished setting the scene, you'll hear a very short excerpt from the film Magic Medicine. The full film follows the journey of three volunteers in a trial conducted at Imperial College London. The aim of the trial was to see if psilocybin, the psychedelic compound found in magic mushrooms, could be used to help those with treatment-resistant depression. Speaking with Professor Nutt today, firstly Michelle Barker-Jones, one of the study's psychotherapeutic counsellors, and Matt Jackson, a participant with some fascinating first-hand insights. Now let's jump into the show. Right, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our host for the evening, who is also the founder of Drug Science. He is the Professor of Neuropsychopharmacology at Imperial College London. You all know him. I don't need to give you an introduction. Please put your hands together to Professor David Nutt. We started working on the brain science of psychedelics about 15 years ago. I was approached by a, an aspiring PhD student called Robin Carhart Harris. He wanted to find out whether psychedelics could help us understand psychoanalysis. I said that was a bit of a tough project for uh, a PhD. He, he should do something simple like MDMA, which he did. Uh, uh, but then he persisted in wanting to study psychedelics, so we started uh, exploring the effects of psilocybin, magic mushrooms. And we did the first brain imaging studies that had really ever been done with that uh, psychedelic. Uh, because as you probably know, th these drugs uh, were all made illegal in 1967 under the, uh, well, in, eventually under the 1971 uh, UN conventions. Uh, which was unfortunate because in the preceding 15 years, there had been a m massive amount of research, particularly on the, uh, the novel synthetic or semi-synthetic psychedelic called LSD. That was discovered in 1943 by Albert Hoffman, uh, working for Sando, trying to find a, a new treatment to improve brain blood flow. Uh, and he discovered he did much, much more than that. And, uh, luckily, in those days, the pharmaceutical industry were kind of interested in science and they... Uh, they listened to Albert, and Albert said this was going to revolutionize our understanding of brains and brain science and maybe even have therapeutic utility. From 1952 onwards, uh, Sandom allowed researchers, about a thousand research groups in the world were allowed access to their, uh, the LSD, which was made by them. And there was an explosion of research. Thousands of papers were published. The U.S. government were so enthralled by the possibility that this was the revolution in neuroscience that they funded nearly 140 separate grants to allow researchers to study LSD. And in Britain there was research as well, uh, not anything to the same extent, but there were significant uh, contributions. Uh, LSD was seen as being slightly challenging to use in a therapeutic way because of the effects of very long-lasting, you know, 9, 10, 12 hours. So fairly soon after uh, Thando uh, made LSD available, they discovered the active ingredient in magic mushrooms was a substance called psilocybin. And then they manufactured that to pharmaceutical quality, and they made that available. And it was a medicine. Psilocybin was a medicine from about 1957 to 67. But then LSD got banned and all the other psychedelics got banned as well, just uh, in case people switched from LSD. And, and the reason LSD got banned, of course, was the Vietnam War. Because young Americans, young American men were being taken 18 and they were being sent to Vietnam to fight a war against an enemy that they never saw for a purpose they couldn't understand. and. Uh, a lot of them decided that wasn't really what they wanted to do, and they went to 
uh, San Francisco and settled in Haight-Ashbury, took LSD, listened to The Grateful Dead, and realized there was more to life than killing people. And that was a real challenge to the U.S. government because these groups fueled the anti-war protest. And uh, there's an extraordinary famous image of protesters with a placard saying, drop acid, not bombs. And that is that it truly is a moral for our time, but no politicians in the West have listened to it. But in fact, it was so threatening to the U.S. modus operandi in terms of sort of world domination that they decided that the only way to stop the protests were to ban the drug. So they did. And LSD is the, really the only drug ever to be banned because it changed the way people voted, in, particularly in relation to war. And that ban had an enormously deleterious effect because basically it became very, very difficult to study these drugs. They were put into what's called Schedule 1, uh, which, was, which is bad enough. But worse, governments decided not to fund the research anymore because it was seen as colluding with the drug takers. So f- funding research on Schedule 1 drugs was seen by government funders as being something that was not to be, uh, supp- it wouldn't be supported. They get political kickback. So there, there has been no funding of psychedelic research in the States by any, uh, by the government authorities since then. And in fact, in Britain, there hasn't been any except for the one study, which is our study of psilocybin in in depression, resistant depression. I want to explain how it came about because this truly is an example of what we call translational science. Because Robin and I, supported by the Beckley Foundation, we did the first brain imaging study on psilocybin using fMRI. And the results were so bizarre we thought it must be wrong because we had expected that when people were having very interesting trips and seeing lots of bright colored lights and floating through space and talking to strange people they met out there including God there might be some areas of the brain which were turned on but in fact they weren't all we found were a couple of areas of the brain which were switched off or turned down in terms of their activity and we thought that was so weird that we couldn't publish it so we redid it using a different brain imaging approach got exactly the same results, and so we then published it. But as part of the uh, understanding that we developed in terms of these changes in the brain, it it became clear to us, three things became clear to us. The first was that when you give magic mushroom juice to people, even in a brain scanner, they often come out of the scanner feeling that their mood's improved. And many of our volunteers said they had a sense of well-being which lasted for days or weeks afterwards. And that was completely concordant with a study that had been done in parallel at John Hopkins where they used uh, psilocybin in people uh, who were looking for some more meaning in their life. These weren't patients, they were just people wanting to understand more of themselves and and, and they found enduring beneficial effects on well-being. But when we looked at the brain images, we saw two sets of changes which made us think about depression. The first was that psilocybin dampened down a part of the brain which we know is overactive in depression and it's a part of the brain which we believe drives the negative thinking in depression and we know that all known treatments of depression dampen down that part of the brain for those of you who are neuroscientists it's called the subgenual cingulate cortex and i'll be asking you questions on it all afterwards so remember that you won't be allowed out so here we had, so it switched, we dampened down the part of the brain that antidepressants and, and CBT dampens down. So that was interesting. But the, even more interesting was the great breakthrough we made was we understood the psychedelic state. For the first time, we could make sense of why you have a psychedelic experience. And that is because psychedelics switch off a circuit in the brain, a network in the brain called the default mode network. And the default mode network is what makes your brain work in the way it always works. It's the network which has got you here and will get you home, will make you make decisions about what you do for the rest of your life. And, and the reason, the psychedelic state, for those of you who haven't been there, is, is a very different state. And it's a state where your brain is no longer functioning to your commands as it has been. It's doing its own thing. It's been liberated. 
But as we discovered this, a French group showed that the default mode network was overactive in depression. And that makes sense because depression is a disorder where people get locked into repetitive, introspective, negative thoughts. And that's what the default mode does. It makes you think about yourself. You, your, your self resides in the default mode network. So we thought, well, if we can disrupt it, maybe we can disrupt it in depression and liberate people from this negative thinking. So those three pointers were sufficient for us to get a grant, the only grant we've ever gotten from the, any research council to study uh, psychedelics, or even MDMA for that matter. Uh, but we did get it. And the reason we got it was because the theory was kind of quite sound. But more than that, the reason we got it was because depression's the largest cause of disability in medicine in the Western world. It causes more disability than heart disease, alcoholism, etc. So people are desperate for new interventions for depression. The trial itself turned out to be very powerful and it's spawned other research in this direction. There is a full-length film which lasts for about 90 minutes and you can see it on Vimeo if you want, Magic Medicine. I just want to tell you how hard it was to do. It took us one year to get the Ethics Committee to allow us to do this. And I was sitting there in these meetings, and they, uh, you know, well, is it safe? When I say, well, you know, a million people every weekend take magic mushrooms, probably it's pretty safe, you know. The MHRA have said, we can do this, the drug is safe. Yeah, but is it safe in depression? Well, I expect some of these people who take it are depressed, and we haven't heard of any problems. But in the end, they wouldn't let us do a controlled study. They said it was too dangerous. And they said, you can only do what's called an open-label study. You have to give everyone the, the, the psilocybin. And you had to monitor them very carefully. And the primary outcome of this study wasn't depression. The primary outcome was whether they lived or died. <laughs> they said we had to treat 12 people for six months, and if no one had really suffered a serious adverse reaction, then we could go on and do the full study. Well, which, of course, was absurd, because we'd run out of money well before then. But anyway... But that was, actually, that turned out to be even easier than the next stage. The next stage was getting the drug. Getting hold of a Schedule I, Class A drug, to use in a clinical trial is close to impossible. It took us 32 months to find someone who would make it. There's only two producers in the world. They had to get all their regulations in place. Then we had to get import regulations, export regulations. You get eight weeks. You get, if you get an import license, you've got eight weeks. How many of you work in universities? Anyone know a university ordering department that can do anything in eight weeks? You get your import license, 12 weeks later they order it, but your license has run out. So you go back and get another license. So it took 32 months of a 36 month grant was spent getting the drug because it's a Schedule One drug. And when I speak to the Home Office and say, look, why do we have this terrible bureaucracy? What are you trying, what's this all about? And they say, well, this is a dangerous drug. It's a Schedule One drug. It's a Class A drug. It has enormous street value. We have to make sure you're not selling it on the street. <laughs> and I say to them, well, I've worked it out that all this bureaucracy means that every dose I have costs £1,500. Not even in Chelsea am I going to get that much. <laughs> So we ran out of money, but we didn't run out of effort. We carried on doing it. We did the study. This is uh, a very short uh, video of one of the patients, and it illustrates three things. It illustrates how horrible a disorder depression is, how powerful psilocybin can be, and how unjust the regulations are, because it's still a Schedule I Class A drug. And that has huge implications for the people we're putting through this these trials, and you'll understand that, and I won't tell you any more. So I'll stand down and we can show the film. Thanks. In 2012, a team of British researchers asked the question. What would happen if we treated 20 people suffering from severe depression with magic mushrooms? I've tried, I think, maybe six or eight different antidepressants and they've never worked. Four years ago, I realised that I couldn't go on like this. I need to find a way to change. We'll be 
be following John as he undergoes this pioneering new treatment. Tell us what's on your mind. I don't know, it just feels like you're stopped. Well, when I close my eyes and try and, I, I can, I try and sleep, but I just go feel like one sort of bad dream to the next. That sort of feels like. It wasn't really what I would have planned or expected. I didn't even realise that's what John needed, but looking back, I could see it was what he needed. It's like the first dose was like lulling him into it. It gave him a sense of, it's okay, I can do this. And then the second dose, it's like, right, now the real work begins. And the real work isn't experiencing some lovely feeling of love from the world. The work is going on a journey within yourself, finding that nugget of pain and integrating it into your life. I'm really hoping and praying that it has worked. At first I really didn't think it was working. It wasn't until the very end when I could sit and then reflect on it that I could see what had happened. All these things that had happened to me when I was a kid, it made me face every single one of them. And nobody wants to do that. Sometimes through it, I could hear bugs, as if a bug was crawling through the ground. So the images that I saw was, was of this massive black and red iron thing with huge spikes pointing out at it. But the experience that it relates to was when some kids had took my t-shirt off and threw me into this massive patch of nettles. And I was beat with uh, hawthorn branches and the bugs that I heard were the bugs that I heard when I was on the ground afterwards crying. The sharp spikes on the big black and red thing were the thorns on the, the branch. It was almost like absolutely everything was trying its hardest to say this is the problem. <laughs> it makes me feel that um, depression is a, a way we cope. As a kid, we, we build up psychological protections for ourselves around about these events, right? But at some point in your adult life, we have to come to terms with that and, and deal with it. This thing does do that. It takes you straight there, uh, exactly what Robin promised. It will take you to a dark place. Whatever the problem is, it will take you straight to that. And you have to decide there and then whether you're going to be a victim of that for the rest of your life or not. Of course, when these things are experienced, they can't be unexperienced, can they? The typical response is to try and forget them and yeah. try and repress them. Perhaps the healthiest way to um, live with them is to live with them consciously. It doesn't mm. feel like there has been some kind of breakthrough. Yeah, it does feel like that. I feel enthusiastic to just go home and start getting on with things, yeah. you know. Before the treatment, yeah, we did have a dad, but if we did see him, it wouldn't be for very long, it'd be like five or ten minutes, and he would have to go back into his room because he'd have a sore head. Since the treatment, she's got much happier. Unfortunately, these results didn't last. Seven months later, we returned to see how things were going with John and family. Out with John is... Pretty much like it was before the trial. It's crap, putting it bluntly. I hoped that the results from the trial would last forever because it was, it was so nice. The kids had their dad back, and to a certain extent, I had my husband back, and it's gone again. It's just, it's all gone. So there you see it—the beginning, the middle, and then sort of end—and it's. Sad as a clinical psychiatrist that I am to see how you can have such a positive impact and then be completely frustrated in not being able to pursue things when uh, the, the effect of the psilocybin switched back. And, and John was begging to have more, but, but I, I, we, I couldn't give it to him because that would be breaking the law. And there are very many people in this country would love to jump on me when I did that and put me away, so... 
Uh, we did suggest to him he might go overseas where the, 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 it's easier to get, but he wasn't in a position to do that. So, an example for you all to reflect on, but I, I hope you'll agree that that little vignette shows the true uh, Im impact that depression has on people and, and why uh, drugs like psilocybin are so important in, as potential new therapies. And here we have Matt, who is uh, uh, someone who's recently, well, a few months ago, been through our new trial of psilocybin. And here is Michelle, who is one of our therapists. So introduce yourselves, please. Good evening. I'm Matt. I'm Michelle. <laughs> it's going to be a long, hard night, isn't it? <laughs> okay, Michelle, tell me, tell me a bit more about you and about why you joined yeah, us in okay. this work. I was working in private practice as a therapist and was aware of just how long traditional talk therapy takes. And I think in 2014, I went to Breaking Convention and I kind of thought, psychedelics and therapy, I can see how they, they could work. And I thought that you could train to be a psychedelic therapist. That really wasn't the case at that point. But around then, I spoke to David and he said they needed guides on their current trial, which was Silodep 1. And I was very fortunate to um, stroll into that position. And I managed to guide a few people on Silodep 1. I've since then been one of the lead guides on Silodep 2. So I've managed to guide lots and lots of people, which has been incredibly rewarding to see the transformations that people can have. Because in, in talk therapy, the moments when people move forward are always experiential. And what psychedelics guarantee is an experience. And so it's those moments when the cognitive and the emotional work together. And I think for me, the emotional breakthroughs, whether it's a mystical experience or biographical experience that happens in the guided psilocybin session, is really grist for the mill for, for, for therapy. So psychedelics and therapy seem to me, what psychedelics do is they catalyze traditional therapy. So that's really how I came to be here. Undoubtedly, you do share your enthusiasm with other therapists. What proportion of what you might call traditional therapists are sympathetic to your, uh, your approach? Basically, I've noticed more and more enthusiasm and people are far more interested, but there is still a huge amount of psychiatrists who are very hesitant, who still believe the stigma and the danger that's been ascribed to psychedelics, that you know, they're still afraid to work with it. So that's a problem of psychiatrists, but you think psychotherapists generally are more open I, I think they're probably more open to it, yeah. Oh, that's good news, thank hmm. you. So Matt, tell us about yourself and about how you came into the, the study and what you experienced. Well, I'm a 56-year-old um, sort of white alpha male, pretty cynical about um, uh, big pharma peddling their pills. I tried a, a selection of them. None of them had worked. In fact, uh, coming off some of them was really quite horrendous. Um, I can only speak about my personal uh, journey through depression um, and thank Michelle and the team uh, and Robin for really saving my life. I, I was at the last chance saloon. I'd had a really shit time. I'd had a cancer diagnosis. I'd lost three very, very close friends who I grew up with within the space of 18 months. Uh, my marriage had broken down. Uh, I'd lost my business um, and I, I really wasn't functioning. So I was pretty desperate um, and luckily uh, I heard about the trial through a friend in uh, the States, R wrote a, uh, a, an email to Ashley, one of uh, Michelle's colleagues, heard nothing for three months and then was selected to go on to the trial. I was really, really keen to sort, out, sort myself out. I was Mr. Grumpy, I was Mr. Angry and I was extremely isolated and going further and further into an extremely black hole. As they say, expectation is the mother of all fuck-ups, so I, I re really had to approach the trial knowing that uh, it might work, it might not, and it could be really, really scary. My only reference point on psychedelics was one winter night 
in a village called Horseman Den with four 18-year-old boys who had each taken a 400 microgram dose of LSD. Three of them had the most ecstatic and wonderful time, but my best friend Simon had the most terrifying experience of his life. I babysat him through the experience, spoke to his mum, kept him balanced. So I came at this, you know, it took a lot of balls to take that, um, uh, that dose of psilocybin. I was shit scared, but I'm glad I've done it. So Michelle, just tell us a little bit more about the process. It's not just come along, sit down, here's the no. pill. No. So tell us how you prepare people for it. Right, so we have three kind of calls or interactions. So there's a screening where I first met Matt, tried to get a sense of whether we have a rapport, whether we think we can work together, because that, that's really a, a bit like traditional therapy. It's really important that you feel you can build a rapport and that trust can be um, f- fostered between you. So we have that first interaction and then... I talk to Matt about the music and his intentions for for the experience. And then we have a day before the dosing day where we spend time together. I kind of fill Matt in on what to expect. And a lot of that is about letting go of expectations, surrendering to the experience, checking that he's okay and that he feels safe with us. So it's really important that he feels that he can trust myself and Johnny in this instance, the co-guide. Yeah, we could just say, you saw in the film that the way we do it, there are always two guides, and a Mm. male and a female. That's incredibly important. And we also do a visualisation to help Matt kind of have a sense of what to expect. And we're encouraging people, you know, walk towards your pain, go and sit with it, go and see what it has to say to you. So it's very much looking at the root of your depression, you know, and being willing to sit, stay in uncomfortable places if necessary so that you can get that sense of shifting through your pain into something different. So there's a lot of kind of therapy, getting to know Matt, making sure he feels comfortable with us before the actual experience. And then in the experience, we're very much like the cabin crew. Matt is going through his experience. We just make sure he's comfortable, he feels safe if he feels distressed or or something challenging is happening we'll hold his hand or we'll breathe with him but it's very much Matt doing the work he has to go in and see what's happening in his internal world and and see if he can come come out with anything that's useful and then after that then we integrate the session people may not know what you mean yes so integration I suppose really it again it's like traditional therapy it's a sense of allowing the participant to make the meanings that they need to make from their experience. It's very much, they've had this very expansive experience and they're so varied and so different. And what we feel is really important is that they come away with their own meanings from that experience because that's what's powerful. It's their own inner healing mechanism that's kind of got them to the point where something important has shifted. So it's really important that we give them the space to make sense of it and how can that translate into your everyday life? What, what subtle changes can you make? Again, like traditional therapy, what can you do differently? And kind of having a sense of they've had this very expansive experience which will inherently contract. So it's really important that they make those small tweaks to transform their life into something more meaningful and, and to deal with the depression. And that happens the day after, I believe, isn't it? Yes, right? yes. So Matt, tell us about the experience. I can't stress enough how important the pre-dosage counselling is. Um, For me, I had a very negative perception of psychedelics. I trusted Imperial College and the team that were working with me, and that allowed me to surrender completely and accept the experience. Um, Unless you've had a psychedelic experience, it's very, very difficult to know what being a member of that club is like. I had a 25 milligram dose. I had fasted before uh, ingesting the dose. To begin with, I had the most wonderful sensual feeling in my legs. My whole body was vibrating to the uh, sort of sound and surroundings. Um, And then some pretty strange stuff happened. I was reading a book from Q uh, and the plants within the ink drawing started to emerge out of the page and I knew something weird was going on. (laughs) It got worse. Uh, um, 
I then put on eye shades and headphones. There was a music track. And I explained to Dave before, it was a bit like entering a museum. Uh, and I was looking at a range of exhibits, clocks, mathematics, Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, and it was all very interesting. I then suddenly realised that I wasn't in the museum. I was actually the museum itself. It was a very challenging experience, incredibly physical. Um, I can't tell you how this medicine works, but it, it, I've spent thousands on psychotherapy and got absolutely nowhere. Within four hours, I had completely changed. Uh, I'd been seriously depressed for about 20 years, but when I came out of the experience, I felt completely healed. I felt confident. I felt resilient. And yes, the, the experience was profound. It was mystical and it was spiritual. I was taken to a place of absolute love. Uh, words can't describe the feeling. It, it was totally amazing. But what was more amazing was what happened afterwards. Um, during the next two to three weeks, I had the most profound insights into uh, some of the causes of my depression and some of the uh, strategies that might help me move forward. My mum had always been very controlling. Um, it had been a sense of great pain for me. But I then understood she was a ballerina. She'd lived a life where she had been emotionally controlled. Her food and diet had been controlled. And that was her style of parenting. And I was able to forgive her and accept that, you know, that's the way it was. But I could do something different about it. And there were many sort of um, insights like that over the two or three weeks. And for me, the post-experience integration and the insights were as profound as the experience. So, Michelle, we, I know you talk, uh, and the other therapists talk a lot about acceptance and commitment. Do you want to just share with us what you mean by that? Right. So, we now have a new model, which is Accept, Connect, Embody, which is based largely on Ros's, Ros Watts did the qualitative analysis of the first Silodep trial, and the themes that seem to emerge in, in that trial were t to do with acceptance. So it's around accepting difficult feelings, being able to sit with them. And that ability to accept those feelings kind of fostered a greater sense of connection. And within the experience, people talked about feeling more connected to themselves, so self-acceptance, more connected to others, to nature, and often a spiritual principle. So for us, these themes of it, learning to accept painful feelings rather than, I suppose, muting them, which traditional antidepressants do or which we tend to do naturally. We try to push away our pain rather than be with it and go through it. Um, and embody has been the addition that we've added in terms of how do you embody that process of accepting your pain, connecting to others, and how do you integrate those insights? So it's, and very much the psilocybin experience can be a very embodied experience. And often depression is about being stuck in your head. So how do you become more embodied, you know, back in your body, connecting to the world? It's, it's a little bit based on acceptance and commitment therapy, but we've kind of shoehorned it to make it something a lot simpler. So it's accept, connect, embody. And of course there is a theory that uh, the neural processes of depression are about trying to avoid accessing. So much mental effort goes into, or brain effort goes into, stopping accessing that you actually become exhausted and depression may be in part that overactive attempt to forget or suppress. And what you're saying is don't accept and then you don't have to put the effort into suppressing. One of the other things I didn't say in my intro is that... Um, just a few days after we published our first brain imaging paper on psilocybin, got an email from Yale University in the States. And they said, hey, why haven't you cited our brain imaging paper on meditation? And of course, I said, well, because I don't read papers on meditation, but yeah, I'm a pharmacologist, come on. But they had shown almost just a month before, interestingly, that transcendental meditation produces similar changes in the brain, particularly switching off the default mode network as, as what we had shown. And that was, that we've had a very interesting dialogue with them subsequently. And that also has some therapeutic relevance, doesn't it? Because mindfulness is clearly now got a, you know, a growing area of, uh, uh, of psychotherapy. 
Well, and often people, as a result of result of the psychedelic experiences, will then be more open to mindfulness as a way to keep them in touch with the realizations or the 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 space that they went to. Maybe that feeling of love or feeling connected to the source. So mindfulness. Um, well, and meditation and yoga, all these things definitely help, I think, with the integration, creating practices that are really about self-care and looking after your, your mind and your body. So, Matt, you're rather fortunate because you're in our new trial. And our new trial, you get two doses, not just one dose. And the reason for that is, in fact, the majority of people in the first trial ended up slipping back towards the depression. For many of them, it wasn't as extreme, but it was certainly still disabling. So in the new trial, we're having two doses to see if we can get the processes, get the depression sort of scattered and then keep it away. I, I'm pleased to say that I've been depression-free. Um, the second experience uh, wasn't what I wanted, but it was what I needed. I'd asked Michelle and the team to change the music, and on the second dose... I put the headphones on and it was the same music and I thought I was back in the first experience. So that was a little disturbing. Um, it was extremely, extremely profound. In this experience, I began to have a real craving for fish. And, <laughs> and I wondered why. Uh, th that was going to become very apparent in about five minutes. Uh, I then started scratching at the, um, on the bed I was sitting on, and I transformed into a puma. I had black hair, orange eyes, big claws, and a real, real hunger for fish. Um, <laughs> the, the best way I can describe this is it was Mother Nature's sort of factory reset for the brain. I um, mean, I was completely stripped away of all conscious reality and taken to a very, 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 very strange place where I literally felt as if I had died. Uh, I then saw a chink of light and I began to reintegrate. And as I came back, um, I was just able to be kind to myself. Uh, I was able to put everything into perspective. And my depression had been a series of cul-de-sacs and ruminating thoughts that you knew were pointless and were totally destructive, but you couldn't get them out of your head. And these things just melted away. So I think, for me, two doses was the sweet spot. I don't have any desire to go back, to go back or repeat the therapy, but I'm very respectful. And I think you have to respect this medicine. If you respect it, it will respect you. If you disrespect it, it will really fuck you up. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important point you make there. So I've, um, as Michelle has pointed out, psychiatrists are certainly more resistant to this than psychologists and possibly more resistant to it than anyone else in the world. So, you know, I have been... Um, fighting a battle to get psychiatrists interested in this for some time. And uh, I had a very illuminating conversation with a, with a real expert recently, one of the psychiatrists I most, most respect in terms of his knowledge of, of certainly psychopharmacology and, and depression. And he said, well, it's not surprising you get better. You know, you have a fun trip. And I said, that, that's completely wrong. And this, this misperception that, that people have that... It's fun. And actually, that taught me two things. It taught me not just that we haven't got the message across, that it isn't fun, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But it also made me realise why these drugs are banned. Because there's a lot of people out there who don't even know what fun is, and they sure as hell don't want you having it if they can't have it. <laughs> so I explained that actually the, going through the therapeutic process is extremely hard work. Yeah, It, it, it is challenging, and you have to be prepared to surrender and that takes a lot of balls because it is terrifying. I, I was suddenly aware that I was connected to the planet, was very connected to animals and nature and there was a whole world that I had, you know, I was 57 years, 56 years old and I had not, uh, it was like being reborn. So it's challenging, you've got to accept it, you've got to face your fear, um, and it ain't for everyone. What would you say to people who are depressed? Uh, it, 
look, if you can save another life, I mean, I know how close I was to, you know, the edge. If we can save one more life, if you can screen people properly, this has got to be, I think, Plant-based medicines are much more advanced than anything we can synthesize or semi-synthesize in the laboratory. For me, it was incredibly helpful. I mean, in four to six hours, I did so much work. Mm. It, I'd spent 20 years fighting this and was pretty cynical when I entered the trial. So thank you. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you, we overcame your cynicism. And, and, and clearly, there's a, but there's a great need to have trained therapists, and that's going to be the real challenge, actually. I think we've, certainly to my level of confidence, and I guess to yours as well, we've shown that this works. It works in people who, in, in which nothing else has worked. We should be working out how we can make it available widely. But we do need therapists, and we, need, you know, and, and we don't have very many. Uh, and uh, that's one of the biggest challenges, I think, is not... It may be a bigger challenge to get the therapy right than it will be to make the drug medicine in the sense of changing the scheduling so it's going to be up to you guys to to, to start getting training courses yeah. in. I mean should it be part of routine psychotherapy training do you think everyone should I th- be exposed yeah. to it I, well I think there's definitely a lot more interest in it and I, and I do think you know if you're a traditional therapist the the potential of helping so many more people you just have to think about traditional therapy as well. Not everybody could access it. It's for people who are more privileged and able to afford it. So if we can scale something like this for the NHS, for the people who are more vulnerable who really need it, then that's something that you know really should be done. And I, I hope that's possible because traditional talk therapy takes a really long time. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, will you have some questions? We have. We've got, we've got quite a lot of questions. So, uh, I, I suggest we probably uh, uh, go through them quite quickly, not give too long answers. Uh, the first question is from Carmen. Carmen says, have you been able to find out from the psilocybin trial the proportion of the healing that is attributed to the drug and how much the other elements of the therapy affect it? And are there any side effects in continually taking psilocybin to treat depression? Ah, well, so let's deal with the second part first. It's really important to understand that it is either, in the case of John, it was one dose. In the case of Matt, it was two doses. I think they were a month apart, yeah? Yeah, three weeks. Three weeks apart. So it is a different, completely different kind of therapy. You have a major impact on the brain and on thinking, and you use those insights and the changes in your brain to overcome the depression in the long term. So it's conceptually very, very different from any other kind of in psychological or uh, pharmacological intervention. It almost you know, maybe ex- extreme exposure therapy in for phobias would be the only thing comparable in terms of current therapy. So, so you're not taking the drug regularly, and therefore you are protected against possible consequences of taking the drug regularly. So, so that's one of the great advantages. And that's actually, of course, one of the reasons why, even though there's a lot of therapeutic input at the time of administering it, it could still be cost-effective because you get a lot, an enduring effect from a single dose. So then there's this fundamental question, and we've been asked this a lot, is it just the drug or is it the drug and the therapy? And now, it's actually very difficult to separate those because it's very difficult to have an experience that he's had without a drug uh, and so how would you, how, how could you, what would you actually do? How could you do the experiment? I mean, we thought about it, you know, we're not stupid. You know, we thought, well, maybe if we give people psilocybin when they're asleep, would it lift their mood? Actually, it'd be a great experiment to do, ethically challenging, but... <laughs> but so I think where we are at present is we know that the drug changes the brain, we know that the drug changes the way you think, and what's really clever about this therapy is we utilize those two things together to produce a really good outcome. So it's a kind of, you're back, it's almost a dualist question, you know, brain and mind, they're the same and they're different. The, same, the drug and psychotherapy, together they're more powerful than either alone. I mean, clearly psychotherapy by itself doesn't work. I'd be surprised if the drug worked as well as the drug plus psychotherapy. So Cassie asks, as a 57-year-old psychotherapist, mm. is there any chance of this type of therapy being used routinely in my lifetime? Let's hope so. I mean, I know there are predictions that 
perhaps if rescheduling happened in five to six years, maybe private practitioners could be administering psilocybin in their practices, how that would really roll out, whether, it would, you know, you'd have experiences at clinics, maybe, you know, you spend a year with a client and you have a few sessions that you work towards. Maybe that's a model for how it could go forward, or maybe it would be clinics with therapists who work at the clinic and people come in and have their experience. But I think a combination of, of therapy and maybe, maybe you know, not two doses, maybe it's six, six doses over a year. But even if that takes a year out of your life, it's, it's far more effective than 10 years or, or 16 years. So let's hope so. So the answer is, is I absolutely hope it isn't five years. Because I'm 68, and I'd like to see it in my lifetime. <laughs> so I think this is a question uh, for you, Matt. Harry asks, did the therapy make you take many physical steps to change your life for the better following the trial, or was it just around changing your perception of things? Harry, that's a great question. Um, I was committed to sorting myself out because I was in a mess. So pre-therapy, I paid particular attention to my diet, particular attention to exercise and particular attention to when I was eating. I spent probably about eight or nine months getting sort of myself ready to go on this journey. I got a lot fitter, I lost a lot of weight, had to buy a load of new clothes and yeah that did help with the depression but it didn't take it away completely. I think post um, experience it has changed my outlook on what I put into my body, how I use my body, and also intellectually, it has changed me significantly. I'd just like to add also that I was aware in Matt's particular case that he was incredibly conscientious on coming on coming onto the trial, and, and that's something I think would be worth exploring, the fact that people who sign up for this and are, who are especially conscientious, I feel, often get a lot more. So there's a sense of they are ready to change. And with Matt, I notice this very much. So a question from Rob. And Rob asks, some people have documented positive effects of ayahuasca experiences by cancer sufferers. Do you know anything about that? Well, we know quite a lot about that because uh, we know what ayahuasca is. We can sometimes spell it right. Um, <laughs> but, but more importantly, we uh, know what's in it, which is DMT, and we've done the first ever brain imaging study with DMT and you'll be relieved to know it's very similar to both LSD and psilocybin so we, it's a serotonergic hallucinogen uh, the reason it's in I uh, you have to take it in the form of ayahuasca is because it's not orally active so ayahuasca is a drink that contains DMT from a plant but it also contains another substance from a plant called harmaline which prevents the breakdown of DMT by the gut and the liver. So we've given DMT intravenously because so we don't have to give the harmaline. Uh, there's loads of evidence that, uh, that ayahuasca has positive effects on, uh, on individuals' mood. There's obviously it's uh, also a hallucinogen and uh, Normally, people don't see panthers except when they're on ayahuasca. But so, so you had that kind of real breakthrough. You had the transatlantic breakthrough. You got to Peru. But, um, but then, of course, you know, some people go even further out of space. Um, yeah, and there's actually been a very interesting study. There were two studies, at least, of brain imaging on ayahuasca. They produce, it produces very similar changes to DMT and to psilocybin. And there's been a very nice controlled trial of ayahuasca in depression showing it works. So... Yeah, if you, if you want to take ayahuasca, yeah, feel free. It's, uh, it has a very similar effect to psilocybin. So Chloe asks, can this form of therapy one day be used on people who may not be clinically depressed, but have gone through a tragic life event, such as an unexpected death of someone close to them, which they are struggling to come to terms with? Well, I would have thought yes, wouldn't you, Michelle? Yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the things I should say... With we're in the process of completing, we haven't quite finished, is a study of asking the question, what happens in the brains of people who aren't depressed when you give them psilocybin? And so we've done a, a low dose versus high dose in people who've never taken psychedelic before to see whether you get changes. And we find the same as the Hopkins group. We find that you do get improved sense of well-being 
from uh, the 25 milligram dose that uh, Matt had. And that's enduring, and it also is associated with changes in brain connectivity. We can see a neuroscientific signature to the psychological changes. So absolutely no reason why it shouldn't work in people who want to make sense of other problems like grief. It's the quick technical question from Crypto Coconuts. Uh, Crypto says, did you use the synthetic psilocybin or mushroom extracted? No, we use, and we have to use synthetic psilocybin because the MHRA, well, let's put it this way. It's very unlikely we'd get permission to use mushroom extract without doing a lot of analytical work to prove what it was. Now, I am sympathetic to those people like Mr. Crypto Coconut. Where is he? Are you the one that writes to me every week saying, why don't you use the bloody mushrooms because they've got 700 out of the different ingredients? Yeah, the entourage effect, etc. Now, I'm very quite sympathetic to entourage effects. I've just come back from a conference on cannabis where I've been promoting that. I'm open-minded. It's just so hard to study. I'd love to study it. So if you've got some funds, we'll do it, all right? So a question from whatever. Have you ever tried the therapy on blind people? I believe that they also struggle with depression and their experience should be much different. Well, interestingly, it's not. We haven't done, we haven't had any blind uh, subjects. Blind people understand colour. Not the same way as you understand colour, but when they take psychedelics, they see different colours. The psychedelics alter the way in which your brain integrates. So whatever you think, you think differently, don't you? I mean, I think you were sharing with me some changes in colour and taste in that, weren't you? In the first experience, um, I was able to uh, taste the music um, and also taste colour. Uh, and that was just before I would, um, I suppose, what's called the peak. Um, it was incredibly interesting. Um, and I'd love to go back there. Mm. So I, I believe blind depressed people would probably respond exactly the same and but no one's volunteered yet but if they we wouldn't you know we would be perfectly happy to put them in the trial uh, michelle a question uh, from thomas which i think is probably for you what decisions were made during the design of the room where each of the candidates undergo the treatment it's really about creating an ambient setting we have salt lamps we have nature and art books to look at we have screens with trees on soft furnishings we have a, an aromatizer with a, a pleasant smell so you can imagine this is in a clinical research facility so we do re- seriously have to transform it from a very cold harsh room into something very warm and you know we have a a golden bowl um a beautiful bowl that we give the the, the pills of synthesized psilocybin to the participant in so there's a lot of care and thought gone into making the room um, lovely or as lovely as we can possibly and it is quite stark when you come out of the experience and go into the normal clinical research facility as there is such a stark contrast I bought my own flowers which I would recommend the aroma was super that's not actually allowed we, we snuck those in but <laughs> uh, Rob's come back with a, with a second question to the previous one that he asked he says uh, thanks for answering but my question was specifically about whether you feel ayahuasca can effectively reduce tumours in size oh, whether, whether psychedelics might be anti-cancer uh, it's not implausible one of the interesting things about resurrecting the research with these drugs is that it turns out see when they were banned we didn't even know what they did we didn't know there were 5-HC2A receptor agonists now we do And it turns out that the 5-HC2A receptor does have quite a lot of expression in immune cells. So it is not implausible that there might be some impact of these drugs on things other than the brain. And actually there are trials going on. One one interesting idea is that you might be able to use low-dose LSD, for instance, to treat asthma, to, to suppress immune responses. So it's not implausible that there might be some utility against cancer. But the problem with ayahuasca is that you don't know what else is in it. There are probably 700 different compounds in ayahuasca. So you couldn't attribute, if there was an anti-cancer effect, you could not attribute it to the DMT or the harmaline. It's unlikely to be the harmaline, I think. Well, thank you. We've gone through a lot of questions, and uh, there actually are a few more in here, but I think in the the interest of um, keeping the evening going, we're going to have to come to an end for this session. But before we go, I'd like you to 
give your very generous thanks to our panelists, so Michelle, Matt, and obviously led by Professor Matt. Thank you.